As you can see, my name is Mark Shaw. We're going to be presenting the communion here, and I want you to kind of take a look uh, here at the front. Uh, Gracie organized this, and it's supposed to be a visual representation here. There's a real crown of thorns up here. So if you've never touched a crown of thorns or you don't know what a crown of thorns looks like, um, come on up here. The, uh, the, the thorns themselves, some of them are, I don't know, three, four inches long. So it's pretty, uh, it changes how you think when you think this is actually on a man's head uh, as, uh, as he was being crucified. So today we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper, which is a type of reenactment of the Last Supper that Jesus spent with his 12 disciples the night of his arrest. Jesus' Last Supper was a four-hour meal. It was really similar to our Thanksgiving. It was a big deal, and there was a lot of discussion going on about one topic, the liberation and freeing of the slaves in Egypt. And simply put, what Jesus did was he changed the entire paradigm. He said, instead of talking about Moses and the freedom there, we're going to actually talk about me. I am going to replace all your thinking and all your thoughts. It was four hours of asking questions. That's what the Seder is, asking a lot of questions. Four hours of answering questions. Four hours of discussing the power of God's liberation. So to start, I want you to take your 3 by 5 card, and I want you to take a pen, hopefully you all have that, and I want you to draw the crucifixion in 30 seconds. You can use stick figures if you're normal, like me. If you're a super duper artist, then go for it. But the point of this is to see what you think when you draw the crucifixion. So go ahead and take a couple of seconds to draw the crucifixion, what comes to your mind. All right. Now, normally, I would have you share, and maybe later when we have our discussion with each other, we can share what we drew, but uh, what I'd like you to do is raise your hand. How many of you drew one cross? Raise your hands real high. One cross, all right. How many of you drew three crosses? Okay, so we're about evenly spread out. The right answer was three, by the way. That was the right, no, there's no... No right answer, no right answer. I, uh, I would typically probably just draw one cross myself. And I'm going to ask you to uh, think of something here. Turn your card over. I want you to think of something that would complete this sentence. So here's the sentence. In the last six months, I have really been suffering because of... So in the last six months, and here I'm trying to get you to engage a little bit, and you don't have to share this with anybody. You can if you want, but this is just, this is for you to think about when, are you suffering? I know some of us are suffering economically, we're suffering because we've lost friends. There's a lot of ways we're suffering, and that's the great uh, common factor that we all have. (laughs) No matter how rich or poor or whatever you may be, you're suffering somehow. We're all in it together. So write that down. It can be one word. It can be a sentence. And I want you to think about when you feel like you are in pain. When you feel like you're in pain, does it make your heart softer? Or does it put your heart more on edge? When you feel like you are suffering, does it make you bitter? Or Does it make you better? Does it make your heart harder? Or does it make you more receptive? Does it make you humble and empathetic or resentful? What does your suffering do for you? So I'm going to tell you a little about my suffering. So uh, as some of you may or may not be aware of, I was diagnosed with a, a burnout, a medical burnout, a couple of years ago. And I'm still recovering. And I wish 
I wouldn't still be recovering, but I am. And those of you who know me closely, you know that uh, my job has affected my health uh, in pretty adversely. And so my suffering, and you can see some of these words up here, my suffering puts me on edge. My suffering makes me oversensitive. My wife will attest to that. Why did you make a big deal out of that? Why are you so oversensitive? But I can get oversensitive. It makes me feel entitled to get my way. It makes me inward focused. It makes me uh, angry. It can make me hurtful. And some people around me might even say I get mean. It prevents me from having empathy. Why should I spend time thinking about your problems when I got my own? Thank you very much. You should actually be listening to me and my problems. It makes me ask, where is God now? And it makes me ask, God, if you're so live loving, why are you letting me go through this? So God has another perspective. God uses our suffering. And when we think of suffering, we're typically, you know, on the cross, we're thinking of Jesus. But I also want you to start thinking about these two folks, okay, next to him, the three. God uses our suffering as a wake-up call, as an alarm clock. He uses it to unleash a humility that we probably wouldn't have. He uses it as a moment of truth, a moment where we're able to make decisions that we normally wouldn't make. Like the prodigal son, suffering can bring us so low that God can open up our minds, open up our hearts, open up our ability even to change put us in a different mindset. And here at the cross, I think God is trying to paint a physical parable. So there's parables in writing. I read a book on parables that I think Tim Priestley turned me on to. Um, and where he talks about that there's a lot of parables that weren't just stories. They are physical parables that Jesus presents. And I believe the three crosses is a physical parable parable that allows us to identify with the cross in a way that we normally wouldn't. It's not just me and Jesus. It's actually me and Jesus, and there's other things going on here and my own suffering. So in Matthew 27, let's read. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. And as they went out they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled this man to carry the cross, and when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall, but when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. And over his head they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. That's this inri here that you see on top of the, uh, on the physical wooden cross here. Then the two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads. You ever had people wag their heads at you? It's kind of, it's hard to keep it going with integrity. And they said, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes and elders, they mocked him. He saved others, he can't save himself. He is the king of Israel, let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God, let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I am the son of God. And get this, and the two robbers who were crucified with him, also reviled him in the same way. You see, you've got a crowd around Jesus, and none of it's looking good. Caiaphas, the high priest, Pilate, the governor. You have the centurion, who later would convert because of what he experienced. Malchus, the servant of the high priest, whose ear had been cut off and restored. Simon of Cyrene, the gambling soldiers, the mocking elders, the mocking crowd, the mocking scribes. And then you have the women who cried out for him. And finally, you've got two robbers, thieves, criminals, whatever you want to call them, and they both reviled him and insulted him. 
And I don't get the feeling that this happened for a moment, and I don't get the feeling this was one little insult. One insult, one mockery, no. I think this went on just as the bandwagon pulled together and everybody got on board. It seems that somewhere, though, over the next few hours, something changed. Let's read what Luke writes about this. Both started, something changes. Verse 39 of Luke 23, one of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked, saying, do you not fear God, since you were under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. So we see something fascinating here. One man continued to insult, and the other man stopped insulting him. Both men suffered, but one man changed. Both men were in pain. Think about your pain. Both men were in pain, and yet one man saw something different, saw something different in Jesus. Both men were in shame, in shame, half naked or fully naked, being punished. And yet one man noticed something in Jesus. He noticed the peace of Jesus, and the other man didn't. Both men were hurting. And yet one man listened to Jesus' prayers and wondered How is this possible? Both men were dying, yet one man allowed his suffering to wake him up, and the other man didn't. Both men were suffocating. That's actually how you die at a crucifixion. Not the blood, not the pain, suffocation. And yet one man had ears to hear, and the other man didn't. One man had eyes to see, and the other man didn't. One man began to defend Jesus, the other continued. Both men were punished, and yet one man left the bandwagon, and the other didn't. Both men were humiliated, yet one man noticed and was blown away how Jesus' death was so different. He noticed that, and he allowed it to change him internally during his own suffering. Both men were bleeding from railroad size nails through their wrists, through their feet, and yet one man found the humility to ask for the impossible, to request, and the other man didn't even know what was going on. He didn't get it. You see, from Jesus' perspective, I have a different identity. My identity, if you think about the freedom, the liberation that the cross offers, that the Last Supper was all about, that the Seder, that the Passover meal was all about liberation. Millions of Jews were celebrating this. They were celebrating their freedom from slavery, yet Jesus turned it into freedom from sin. Jesus turned it even more so into a freedom to choose. And that's what I want you to think about. Jesus said, you can choose despite your suffering. You're not a victim of your suffering. You are not a slave to your pain. Doesn't mean we don't have empathy for each other, but it empowers you. Jesus says you can do it. You don't have to keep on the bandwagon. You can choose to have eyes that see. You can choose to have ears that hear. You can choose, despite your pain, despite your sin, despite what people have done to you, and people have hurt you. And even if they've literally crucified you, you can rise above. You can choose to be the one man and not the other. 
So right now, we're going to go into our discussion. And what we do here in the church, and I think this is fantastic, because if you think about what the Passover meal was, it was a four-hour long discussion. Lots of questions were being asked, lots of questions were being answered, and to this day, that is what happens in the Passover meal that the Jews celebrate. So for this discussion, we're going to break into small groups of three to four people around you, in front of you, next to you, and I want you to look at the answer that you wrote. If you are courageous enough to share it, maybe it doesn't take courage, maybe it does, that's fine. Uh, look at the answer that you uh, wrote, I feel like I've really been suffering because of whatever it is. And I want to ask you this, and maybe discuss this, how have you allowed your own suffering and pain to prevent you from experiencing Jesus' freedom and value? I'm not going to make you categorize yourself, I'm, this, <laughs> I'm, the, I'm the good robber or the bad robber, you don't have to do that, you know, I'm such a bad, no, that's not the point. But, because I know we're all in kind of going both places, but I, I want you to look at your own suffering and I want you to understand you are free to choose despite your level of pain. Is that what you're experiencing right now? Is that your relationship with God or is that something that you feel like, wow, you need to kind of understand the cross and his love for you even more? So let's take five minutes and discuss this. All right, I hate to pull you away from your discussion. Let's go ahead and bow our heads and uh, let's pray. Thanking God for the juice and the bread that represents his body and his blood. Father, help us to view the cross even when we suffer and especially when we suffer. Thank you for the suffering you put in our lives. I ask that it serves to make us better and not bitter. I ask that it points our eyes to you instead of inwardly to ourselves. Thank you for the bread which represents the life of Jesus. Help us to watch him and notice his death and behold his suffering and examine how gracefully he died in his final hours. Help us to have eyes that see and ears that hear. Thank you for the juice that Jesus redefined as his blood. Help us to bask in the overflowing freedom that Jesus has given us. Freedom from slavery, freedom from sin, freedom of choice, freedom from being a victim of our own pain and suffering, freedom to look beyond ourselves, freedom to defend Jesus when the bandwagon insults him. Full freedom to authentically be humble and to ask you for a new life and a new chance every day. Amen.